Hi, I'm Lindsay. And I'm Marshall. Welcome to Tumble, the show where we explore stories of science discovery. Today we're talking about the fastest land animal on Earth, the cheetah. Why are they so fast? Is it because they always have somewhere important to be? We'll meet a biologist who spent her days watching cheetahs in the Serengeti to discover the connection between their incredible speed and their survival. We've heard from a lot of Tumble listeners who love cheetahs. They're one of the better cat species, I think. (laughs) Our listener Spencer says cheetahs are his favorite animal, and he sent us this question. Hi, my name is Spencer, and I am six years old. I want to know how cheetahs get their super speed. Cheetahs can run up to 65 miles per hour, or 104 kilometers per hour. Spencer has a theory about how they do it. I think a cheetah gets its super speed from its spots. So I guess the spots are like like turbocharges or something? (laughs) Maybe. Let's ask the rest of our listeners. How do you think that cheetahs get their super speed? Think about it, because we're about to race into the world of cheetah science. To find out how cheetahs get their super speed, I called up a cheetah scientist, Anne Hilborn. She's had a soft spot for cheetahs since she was a kid. I had a plush cheetah when I was six or seven and they're just they're just also really cute and they're one of the few cats that purr and so that's really appealing (laughs) i find so what's the story on the speed is spencer right it's just spots it's about hunting it's about catching their prey and told me that cheetah super speed is all about running for their next meal And so cheetahs have developed a lot of anatomical adaptations so that they can be so much faster than even, say, the fastest dog or the fastest other cat. The fastest dog is that it's probably not a pug. Yeah, and we're talking about cats like lions, not like the neighborhood cat. (laughs) Sure, though I've seen socks get some good head of steam when there's tuna on offer. (laughs) Yeah, so what Anne means by anatomical adaptations is the features of a species body that help them survive. And there's a whole list of them. So some of the more obvious ones when you watch them run is that their spine is really flexible. Cheetahs are actually bendy. Both their front and hind legs can extend even further and then it retracts quickly and so that when all the legs come together under their body, it can bend sort of the other way quite deeply. Like a spring and they have adaptations of their hips and their shoulders so that their legs can go straight out and they're not sort of stuck under their body, which means that they can sort of go full stretch in their run and have this giant stride of up to seven meters. That's 23 feet. Like, imagine four full-size beds placed end-to-end and a cheetah can jump over all of them in a single stride. I'd say crossing four beds in a single stride would be a pretty amazing slumber party trick. (laughs) Do one of those and then keep going. (laughs) So cheetah chests are also shaped for running. It isn't wide, so it's sort of flattened so that it doesn't get in the way of their legs as they go back and forth. Um, And then they have a tiny waist and then sort of big, powerful hind legs, which, which help them run. So cheetahs are literally built for speed. Yeah, and there's also adaptations we can't see on the outside of their bodies. And in order to run that fast, uh, you need a lot of oxygen. If you've ever gotten winded while running, which I think we all have, you know that not having enough oxygen really slows you down. I take it that's not a problem cheetahs have. Like, they're not like, oh my god, oh, I'm so out of shape. I shouldn't, I really should be running more. (laughs) Cheetahs have smallish heads, but really big nostrils for taking in all that air. And then they have really large lungs and a large heart and um, big blood vessels to keep the blood pumping. And so all of these adaptations together mean that they're really, really fast. 
Okay, so I get why cheetahs are better runners than us. It's, it's not that we just need to train more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In terms of evolution, cheetahs have put all of their cards on speed for survival. So that means while cheetahs can beat anyone who challenges them in a sprint, it also has some drawbacks. So they're good at running fast, but they're not super powerful like lions or leopards. To have all that space for the nose, their jaws are small, so they just they don't have the bite strength of, of other big cats. So they've sort of sacrificed strength for speed. Okay, but who cares how strong you are when you can outrun everyone on Earth? Well, it goes back to what Anne said at the very beginning. It's about hunting. It's about catching their prey. Anne studies how cheetahs hunt, the relationship between predators and prey. It's sort of the most basic and intrinsic interaction between two species because it involves life and death. So like the classic scene in the nature documentary, the wildebeest has escaped the lion's jaws this time and will live another day. (laughs) Even though it's not like a friendly interaction. (laughs) Like, hey, how about I eat you today? (laughs) How do you feel about that? Anyhow, this really reveals the relationships between species in a practical way. Then it helps you figure out, like, if the number of, of gazelles started to decline for some reason, what would happen with the cheetahs? So, like, if you want to save the cheetahs, you really got to make sure there's something left for them to eat. Exactly. And that's why Anne wants to figure out how cheetahs hunt. Does their super speed pay off when it comes to getting their next meal? And it turns out no one knows. There's just so much to discover about it. And Serengeti is such a great place to do it because you can actually see it. The Serengeti is the most famous wildlife preserve in Africa. It's an ideal cheetah hunting ground and also an ideal cheetah observing ground when you're a scientist. It can be absolutely covered in thousands of thousands of wildebeest and zebra and gazelle. And it's just an amazing spectacle. Anne spent nine months watching cheetahs to find out how good they are at hunting. We would drive to the top of any sort of small hill and then scan for cheetahs. And what we were looking for is like this little bowling pin or triangular shape popping up out of the grass or sitting on a termite mound. That was the best because they're really visible when they sit on termite mounds. Oh, I'm just a cheetah looking for a chair. Oh, a nice termite mound. <laughs> Anne waited for cheetahs to wait for their prey. A cheetah hunt is, is slightly complex, actually. They need to first find something to hunt, and then they need to stalk it, and then they need to chase it, and then they need to kill it, which can take a bit of time, and then they need to eat it. Just like, you know, we go through our cookbook, decide on a dinner recipe, do some stocking. I I mean, sorry, shopping for ingredients. <laughs> Same thing. Except the cheetahs have a lot more to worry about when they finally get that meal. And so there's these bigger animals who are built for strength, things like lions and hyenas, which if they come on a cheetah on a kill, will the cheetah will run away. And so the cheetah, when it's eating, has to think about the risks. So cheetah's speed can't really keep their meal from being stolen. Yeah, and it's that trade-off Anne was talking about between speed and strength. The stakes can be even higher than missing a meal. If it's a mother cheetah with cubs, their cubs are vulnerable to being killed by these larger predators. Only 5% of cheetah cubs make it past the age of 18 months when they start to live on their own. So that means, like, out of every hundred cheetah cubs, only five make it to be grown-ups? Yeah, it's really unbelievable. And cheetahs only live to be four if they're male or eight if they're female, on average. So that's why Anne wanted to figure out the cheetah strategy for how to avoid danger during mealtimes. I was interested in how different groups of cheetahs handle this risk when they're on this tasty pile of food, but they're also in a vulnerable situation. So when Anne went out to the grassy hills of the Serengeti to collect her hunting data, she had some ideas of how things were going to go. Unexpectedly, I thought mothers with cubs, they're super exposed. The cubs are in danger. They're just going to try to eat as fast as possible and get out. Just go somewhere safer. Anne thought the cheetahs without cubs would be slower, you know, take more time to enjoy their meal. But what we found was actually the opposite. What she saw were mothers and cubs having long meal times and single cheetahs chowing down and then dashing off. 
this was confusing. I was scratching my head. I was like, why are these female cheetahs who have the, all these vulnerable cubs like staying there? And eventually it, we sort of realized it was because they were using a different strategy. They were using vigilance. The mother cheetahs were constantly on the alert for predators. Oh, so if you're a cheetah mom, you really can't eat and run. You have to keep your head up. Exactly. They can't just rely on being fast when it comes to making sure their bellies stay full. And that's especially true for mothers who are working against the odds to keep their cubs alive. Oh, so it's like cheetahs made a bet on speed. Being fast will definitely help us survive. But that strategy doesn't cover absolutely everything all the time. Right. Cheetahs have adaptations outside of speed, like Anne's discovery of mothers being alert while eating. Knowing those adaptations helps scientists put together the whole picture of how cheetahs survive in their environment under different conditions. Knowing what conditions are good for them and how we can help maintain those conditions are pretty critical to making sure that they don't go extinct. So conditions like how many gazelles need to be around if cheetahs aren't actually all that great at hunting them. Yeah, things like that. Cheetahs are close to being an endangered species right now. If we don't want them to go extinct, we have to have a conservation plan or a way to make sure that they can survive. We know what the threats are. It's just, it's just doing something about them. And that's really tricky. But there's a lot of smart, dedicated people working on it. So hopefully... Hopefully they'll be around. So even though we know a lot about how cheetahs get their super speed, there's still so much more to learn about them. Totally. And the same goes for other awesome animals, too. Listeners, do you have a favorite animal? Have you ever wondered why it has certain adaptations? Like, why does my favorite animal, the spiny anteater or echidna, lay eggs? <laughs> Or why do sea otters, which are obviously the best animal, float on their backs? They look so relaxed, but they probably have a better reason for doing it than just chilling out. Think about all of the adaptations your favorite animal might use to survive in its environment and why they might be so useful. Thanks to Anne Hilborn, postdoctoral researcher at the University of California, Riverside. Thanks to Spencer for sending in his super speed question. We have more cheetah science with Anne Hilborn in our bonus interview episode. She has an amazing and hilarious story about the time she dropped cheetah poop on herself. And there's photos to prove it. In the picture, I'm sort of got this sort of ah look on my face, and I'm looking down at my ankle to see if the bit that had fallen off had managed to like hit my foot or not. <laughs> oh man, I really want to hear how that happened. If we <laughs> pledge on Patreon or sign up for a premium channel on Castbox to hear the rest and more interviews with our featured scientists, and we'll have those cheetah poop pics on our blog too, along with more cheetah science. Check it out at sciencepodcastforkids.com. I'm Lindsay Patterson, and I wrote and produced this episode. I'm Marshall Escamilla, and I make all the music. Thanks for listening, and stay tuned for more stories of science discovery.